But hello everyone and welcome to New Approaches for Maximising Academic Integrity Among Students, a Times Higher Education webinar in partnership with ExamSoft. My name is Julia Gilmore, I'm the Content Manager for Special Projects at Times Higher Education and I'll be chairing today's discussion. Please note that a recording of today's discussion will be available on demand along with a summary article on the Times Higher Education website should you wish to revisit the webinar or share it on social media or with colleagues. I'm delighted to be joined today by a panel of experts from academia and industry who are Dr. Divya Beda, Director of Education and Assessment at ExamSoft, Therese Bird, Educational Designer and SCORE Research Fellow at Leicester Medical School, Dr. Fadi Munshi, Executive Director of Assessment at the Saudi Commission for Health Specialties, and Claire Stewart, the Director of Examinations and Assessments and Clinical Associate Professor at the University of Nottingham. Those of you in the audience will be able to put questions to the panel using the chat box provided. Um, we'll try to answer as many of these as possible during the session or during the closing five to 10 minutes, we'll probably have another section for Q&A. So the mass shift to online and blended learning has correlated with an increase in academic dishonesty among students. Modern universities have a range of technology and approaches available to them to help reverse this trend, but doing so is a persistent challenge. I would now like to hand over to Andrea Ariza, Associate Director of Marketing at ExamSoft, who will introduce us to the platform. Over to you, Andrea. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Andrea Ariza. I'm the Associate Director of Marketing at ExamSoft, which is part of the Turnitin family. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with ExamSoft, we are the leading provider of assessment um, for assessment software for both on-campus and remote programs. And our secure assessment solution allows educators to efficiently create, administer, mark, and analyze assessments to improve student performance, simplify uh, curriculum management, and streamline accreditation reviews. ExamSoft offers unparalleled exam security combined with comprehensive and customizable data reporting to deliver a holistic view of exam, course, and student performance for an entire class, a cohort, or an individual exam taker. And so with ExamSoft, you gain access to the in-depth learning analytics needed to make data-driven decisions, creating a powerful and lasting impact on the exam process and student learning engagement and retention. Um, and that's a little bit about ExamSoft. I'll drop a couple um, resources in the chat that we have, um, and I'll pass it back over to you, Julia. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Andrea. I'd like to begin our discussion now by asking the panel, how can you educate students about academic integrity to promote best, best practice? Um, who would like to start? Um, Therese, would you like to start? Okay. Um, well, I think in medicine, we're quite fortunate that we have a um, a framework of professionalism that we are expected to teach the students. And I really think that other disciplines could benefit from imitating this um, by explaining to the, you know, basically we teach them through all five years, six years for some students, what is professionalism? What is it um, as you're a student and what it means for when you are a doctor? And of course that includes um, academic integrity. Um, in fact, it's part of the examination process for us to even accept them as students. We examine about their attitudes toward um, towards plagiarism and that sort of thing. So um, by, by kind of uh, teaching this as we go along in lots of different framework, frameworks, we've got lectures, we've got online courses, um, you know, even to how you handle your social media, all these different kinds of things. It kind of gives them the mindset of academic integrity that we expect. Fantastic. Um, and Divya, what would what what do you think is the best way to educate students about academic integrity? So, so the, you know, I want to build on what Therese said. I think you know we often assume that ethics and morality is something that students should just bring from their homes. And I think when we think about our students, we need to frame it as that is part of the learning that we need to teach them, right? And so, framing academic integrity as yet another concept that they need to learn is a good good idea. I think also sharing with the students the why. We often tell them you shouldn't do this, you should do this but we don't tell them the why. So explaining the why of academic integrity, which is 
it's about equity. It's about opportunity that if you engage in any academic misconduct or, or cheating or anything like that, you are actually taking away opportunities from your poor peers who would ideally then be eligible. Talking about equity from a perspective of there are there's so much of faculty hours put in to academic integrity, in, into building test questions, into preserving test questions and carrying them forward, right? Like it's hours and hours of labor. So the minute some there is a breach or there's a compromise in that, then there's that much more effort that faculty have to put in. So framing it in that way so that you, you bring the students along with you in the journey. There is also, I think there are cultural differences for students, right? Where in certain cultures, there's a pressure where you say, it's okay, like you will learn this. You will be a good practitioner. Like I will, I, and if I don't help you, then your family is gonna be you know, financially they are going to be financially impacted because you don't pass and you're not ready to practice or whatever it is, right? So helping students understand that yes, there are pressures or there are cultural, uh, different cultural interpretations of what constitutes academic integrity and what is okay in terms of collaboration and help and support and helping students understand that nuance. I think just having these conversations upfront proactively, I think is really, really valuable. So those are some of, some of the things that come to mind. Yeah, if, um, if you allow me, Julia, just to add on to that, um, yes. I think I think really um, when we look at students or, or trainees or residents, or I think the psychological factor is the most significant factor when it comes to cheating uh, or academic dishonesty. Uh, it's really the pressure. Um, if you have an honor code, if you have policies, procedures, so it's really looking at that pressure that's being put into exams now and how it's perceived by students. Um, there, there was the, the fraud triad where there are three main positive predictive factors of, of cheating behavior. And that's, if it, is there an opportunity? Uh, is there an incentive? Or is there a very high pressure? Or is there a need? And probably the third one, rationalization. So I rationalize that other people are getting high grades because they're cheating, so I would do that too. So I think tackling those three from each, from a different perspective, from the pressure, and including more assessments that are related to formative uh, assessments for, for feedback. Uh, and then the opportunity, less opportunities for cheating. And then there comes a rationalization and the attitude and behavior of the Institute with honor codes and the tolerance towards, uh, towards this behavior. Really. So do students perceive, is there a cheating culture, perceived cheating culture where this is accepted or not? and what honor code is being presented. I was gonna follow on from that if I may. And, and, and I, think, I think that training and openness and transparency is there, but actually what Divya was saying about taking the students along the journey and actually really involving them in this process right from the beginning, not just actually um, kind of the outcomes and training, but actually in process design and actually what they perceive should be the consequences and of, of any academic misconduct. But I think backing onto that is a university-wide culture. We need, we need the whole organization from whatever member of the team you are to actually really kind of embrace this as an approach. And it's not just in an approach in the training and everything we do, but also in the language that we use. We still use language um, in our lectures and in, in the way that we talk or in our mentoring situations that say, if you do this, you'll get through, or if you do that, you'll get through. And I agree with what Vardy was saying, but actually we need to change the approach to assessment full stop. Actually, it needs to be checksums. You know, we need to change this culture of single endpoint assessments yeah. to one of more of a programmatic, a can do, show us what you can do. And actually I agree with what Fadi says, it kind of goes with that culture of, of um, formative. Uh, yeah, formatives and academic integrity, but also um, making sure that you take the pressure off the assessments. So it's a combination of two for me. So what Fadi and Claire like mentioned just brings up a few other things for me. And, and uh, we, I had this conversation with one of the board members of the International Center for Academic Integrity. Um, and you know, we we do we have a lot of resources on the ExamSoft website, but we have we did a, a podcast recording with him where I interviewed him. And 
he was sharing one of his experiences being someone in this field, immersed in this field, is constantly students often, to Fadi's point, students often engage in cheating when either they don't have study skills, they don't have time management skills, and so then they feel like high pressure. So it's actually like there are these other skill sets that they need to learn in terms of learning the material efficiently, being able to understand, okay, what does it take for me to master this? What does it take for me to internalize this learning? And how do I demonstrate this? So it's almost like we need to scaffold so many other things and make sure students are ready for success before we even think of punitive action for academic uh, you know, integrity violation. So, yeah. Yeah, we actually have had um, an interesting question from the audience related to this. Um, someone has asked, do you think it should be um, the issue of academic integrity should be addressed within a common ethical framework in all courses? So in all fields of study. So in the UK, the QAA in higher education has an ethical, uh, um, an academic integrity code. I can't remember exactly what they've called it. I think it's an academic in integrity charter. So there is one written in the UK by the QAA which talks about a lot of the concepts that we talked about, about kind of everyone being responsible, et cetera, for it. Mm -hmm. And I think actually, if we applied that across higher educations, both in the UK and wider, I think that would that would help. I think it, um, one thing that I've worked with working with Divya for a while is that this is a global approach. You know, actually, we all have the same issues, no matter where we are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that would be an amazing thing to adopt. If I can just jump in as well. Um, so when uh, Divya started speaking, um, you mentioned about the why behind behind it. And I would also broaden that to the, the why is this a problem if we all engage in this? You know, so for example, in uh, the allied health professions, we can talk about patient safety and patient outcomes. And that's just an obvious, you know, it's a given, you know, and that's also yeah, something that we, be, that we- Would you want to be, you know, would you want a doctor or exactly. a nurse not qualified to- Yes, exactly. And, the, and, and those kinds of scenarios are built right into the training, but, you know, broadening it out in, in other professions as well. Um, what kind of research is done if people are not honest with, you know, with our findings, if, um, if people take shortcuts, um, what does it do to the body of knowledge to which we are wish to contribute? So, um, so yeah, I'm just kind of imagining the ethics course that should be that should be done in every discipline <laughs> to cover all of these things. <laughs> so, I would just add, sorry, uh, sorry, Fadi. I would just add to Therese and Claire's point. Yes, to the person who asked that question. Yes, it should be institutional. It should be at the program level. It should be at the course level. And to Claire's original point, and you know, in her first response, I think the way we talk about academic integrity, the way we communicate about it, to bring people along as partners, to bring our students along, saying this is a relationship. This is a relationship of trust. We're all learning together, and there is an impact because we make program decisions based on assessment performance. So then we will be imp we may impact the program negatively because we think the data tells us something, but it's telling us something else. So explaining the consequences. Sorry, Fadi, go, go for it. Um, no, thank you, Therese, for adding. Um, Therese, uh, you mentioned, Therese, uh, the healthcare professional. So uh, probably talking from a practical perspective, um, I have I oversee around five test centers that are located in different cities in the, in the country, and they have more than 500 seats. Uh, we have around 150,000 test takers each year. And usually when we find, this is brick and mortar test centers. So it has all the security you could mention. All you can see, you think about all the security measures. Um, when we find someone cheating, like imagine someone going into an examination related to emergency medicine. How many notes can you take about emergency medicine? You would need, you would need like many books, reference books. So they have a cheat team, some, some note written on, 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 on a paper note. And on a sticky note, and what and when we investigate those, they're very rare. But when we go investigate, usually this person is this is the last attempt, or they've tried so many times. There's and, and we have a saying that if you if you corner a cat, it will scratch. <laughs> they're pressurized. They're under so much pressure. So this is the last resort they they try, and usually it does not work. Um, but having that honor code, having the professionalism, having the patient safety, 
it's still, it will try to deter as much as possible, but also you need to detect if there's any cheating happening. Yeah, I'd love, love to ask about um, preventative measures. So obviously, if you're understanding student motivations for academic dishonesty, that can help you um, put certain preventative measures in place to help the students who are concerned. What do you think the best measures the institutions can take are? Can I come in there? Yeah. Yes, so, of course. Um, I think all of the elements that we've talked about in terms of training and educating has to be the basis of it. The kind of the general understanding and that cultural approach to academic integrity has to be there. But I think it's really vital that we um, design our assessment constructs to mm -hmm. fit with, with the needs and, and actually to be able to adapt them to how technology is changing the way that we assess students and actually the changing the, the content of the assessments too. And as long as we keep pace with that, and I think almost assume, uh, kind of almost stay one step ahead, then we can start to prevent some of that. So again, you, you're looking at the individual basis about their motivation, looking at an organizational basis, but then also going back to an assessment construct to making that fit um, to try and prevent any academic misconduct. So I have a, go for it, Therese, sorry. Okay, no problem. I was just going to say, um, so we use ExamSoft and we explain to the students, well, first of all, we use ExamSoft for many formatives. So the students get used to it. They get used to the, you know, how the technology is going to act. And then on the day when it's a summative, it's not that scary because they've been used to it. But they're also aware of what they can do, what they cannot do. So if you're going through like multiple choice exams or in our case, single best answer, um, yes, you can navigate back. You know, is there uh, spell checking available? Um, what, what all the constraints are, and then the students are quite used to it. And um, they, they, know, they know what the rules are and they know that everybody knows what the rules are. And so they, they kind of feel like it's an even playing field. And I don't know about other um, disciplines, but medical students are so competitive that <laughs> they want even more rules put in place, even more constraints. They want that invigilation to be working really well so that um, they know that their buddy's not going to cheat because, you know, they want it to be fair. So, <laughs> so if everybody knows the rules, everybody knows what the technology can do and what to expect, that just seems to, to help on the day. So I would I would just add um, you know building on every everything that everyone else said and first I, I'm loving the conversation in the chat as well so feel free folks to add your expertise um, as well in the chat and your experiences but but the things that come to mind is um, you know have orientation so when we talk about preventative measures have that orientation around academic integrity so that students understand the why the what the how everything have a deep conversation. So sometimes when we build a campaign around a slogan or anything, the message and the meat of it gets lost. So make sure you make you keep revisiting that. Have it in your syllabus, have it you know, in, in required learning as part of ethics. I would also say the authenticity and the relevance of your assessments matter. So when I go to various institutions and you know, do trainings and professional development, um, what comes to mind is, is your assessment, does it really need to be the way you've set it up? Does, is it reflective of the learning that you want students to demonstrate, right? And so making that, making the outcomes explicit, like what do you want students to be able to do or demonstrate? Making sure that they understand what we want them to learn and demonstrate. Making sure that, you know, there's a transparency in these are the outcomes we want you to achieve. These are the emphasis areas in terms of the curriculum we want you to focus on and really absorb to get to a higher level of thinking. This is how we're going to assess it. And so having that level of transparency, having relevance to the assessments and making it authentic so that it reflects what's happening in the real world, what they're going to have to do in the real world will help them see the point of the assessment and help them see that. And then building on to Teresa's point, like have those formative assessments so that technology is not a barrier. It's an it's a it's a support mechanism to conduct the assessment. So those are all some things that come to mind. Yeah, can you tell me just, um, I would, I, uh, the framework of looking at preventive measures, I think looking at the four different factors, the individual, the institute, and the medium of delivery, and the assessment, speci and assessment specific. 
So um, when they look at uh, probably we talked about individual a bit and the institution. Um, medium, I'm sure the medium of delivery, probably most of the discussion will go into that medium of delivery being online, being brick and mortar center testing or in person. Um, I think from the perspective of assessment specific, what is types of assessments or tools of assessments are we using? Um, like we know that multiple choice questions, um, essay questions probably are much more easier to, to cheat uh, compared to if there's critical thinking, synthesis, collaborative assignments where people work together. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the preventive measures is the tools. When we changed, I think in 2020, when we had that major shift where we, all of us the whole, around the world, there's one of the things that's global that happened all over that we needed to shift into this digitalization and delivering our exams uh, remotely. Um, I think one of, the, one of the bad tracks that we took or some of us took is that we converted what we had in person automatically converted into online delivery. Um, I think we did not make that change that this is a different medium of delivery. We might not need to reconsider even how we teach, even our teaching. Um, and, but to focus here on the assessment, we just took the same assessments that we were delivering in person and we, in class and we started delivering them online. I think giving that assessment specific uh, matters more focus and what is suitable for in-person might not be suitable for online delivery of exams. And that will have, that would be one of the very important preventive measures in my, in my opinion. I think that's, that's absolutely crucial. It's a real bugbear of mine that we just literally plant a, a paper-based system or an in-person based system onto the, the new technology. And, and I think we need to evolve with the process. But I think the other thing that's really important and it's coming through the chat a little bit is that as faculty, we have face validity. So we actually believe in the systems that we're applying. And I know that when we implemented, so I moved from a small school to a, a, quite a large school, both mm -hmm. of which were using ExamSoft to, as a platform, kind of one of them adapted ExamSoft as we moved into the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. Was that face validity? It's that, it, it, you know, exams where you sit in an exam hall with a bit of paper, goes to a mark, marker to mark, feels comfortable for us all. Actually, we know what to look out for when it turns to integrity. We know to, to not let water bottles in. We know not to let any, any other equipment in to provide them pen and paper. We know all that. Um, so moving into this field becomes a little bit uncomfortable mm -hmm. as to what we're dealing with. And I think face validity in the faculty is just as important as face validity for the students. That's such, a, that's such a great point. And I think also today, the conversations around equity in assessment and so thinking of, you know, irrespective of the fact that we have, we transposed brick and mortar into online, there is also, the, are, are, we, are we assessing student knowledge in a particular field or are we assessing their delivery of that knowledge, right? Like, so the modality changes. I may be a very poor writer. I may be very good at speaking and presenting. And so then if my assessment is in an essay form, then am I, you know, am I challenged then and do I lose my points or whatever base because I don't know how to write a strong essay as opposed to if you ask me that question, I can tell you like off the bat, right? And so these are the conversations happening now in the assessment field around how do we frame assessments and offer multiple modalities for students to demonstrate their knowledge and what knowledge do we really want them to demonstrate mm -hmm. and how are we grading them and assessing them for that? So just something to throw out there for consideration. Yeah, we've actually had quite an interesting point on our Q&A. Um, so someone has said, surely a very important starting point is surely is to help students to understand how to avoid plagiarism, how to present the views of others in ways that do not constitute plagiarism and cheating. I'm not sure that a punitive approach is the way to begin. So how can you teach students about the difference between plagiarism and citing a source? And how can you create constructive disciplinary procedures to affect change? Well, I'm aware of the. Oh, sorry. No, no, go for it. We were doing it at the same time. Okay. Now, I am I am aware of the technique of um, allowing students to write, put their writed, uh, their their writing, their written piece into Turnitin, and um, to see how it comes back, and then you have, and then you use that as uh, a discursive event about um, just that, just as. Uh, 
as the person typed in the Q&A, um, how do you represent the ideas of others without just copy paste? Uh, there, you know, we are all standing on the shoulders of giants. We are all not, uh, you know, not doing our original research, obviously. So how do you um, uh, incorporate that? And sometimes a, 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 an easy way to get started has been for us to just say, okay, students, go ahead and drop that into turn it in, let's see what you get back. And then we'll turn that into a discursive piece. And we've, we've actually made, um, uh, videos of the, of the teacher taking a piece and kind of going through and saying, right, this is how you should have done it. Right. So the way that you can word it is this, here's how you handle it. If it's a direct quote, et cetera, like that. I think for me, so I, I started as a GP. Okay. So my medical background is I'm a GP. I went to my GP training and everyone said, you have to reflect because this was like just late nineties, early noughties. And it's like, you've got to reflect and you've got to do your PDP. And I was like, yeah, well, what have I got to do? They go, you've got to reflect. You're like, yeah, well, what have I got to do? And you're like, mm. and nobody actually taught me what it is. And I think the point about teaching, and that's where it comes back to that early, early conversation about cultural aspects and it being completely embedded. Now, in medicine, it is embedded because we've got doctors and professionals as one of our outcomes. Um, and, and so it, it's there, but it, it probably isn't as embedded as, it, as much as it should be. And actually, one of those things is that early years kind of first term at a higher education institute where you embed what academic integrity is, what good writing is, what referencing is, what citing is, what the difference is between academic misconduct um, and poor act academic practice and where the barriers are and educate everybody about it. And if we start to educate everyone, actually the faculty knowledge and confidence about having those conversations will increase too. So what Therese said and what Claire said, I think brings to mind this distinction for me, which I hadn't thought about before, but it's, it's this, this idea that, you know, we don't have to have original thought. I mean, we, we say that, but our thought, like as Therese said, like it's built on others thinking, it's built in conversation, what we're reading, and then we have a way of looking at it that five other people may. And so, so make that distinction saying it's not that you have to be completely new and completely innovative which then stresses students out it is how do you express yourself and your way of thinking adequately so i would just offer that to, to today's point and then the second thing is um when we think about students i've often been in situations where and again trainings where faculty themselves don't understand how to interpret the results of technology and so then they think that students have cheated when the students have not so it's very important that as much as we say we need to educate our students we as, as faculty need to educate ourselves and make sure we understand how to interpret results, what, what that looks like. And then the last point I'll make related to how do we do this, you know, to the question that was asked is, um, I've heard faculty time and time again saying, you know, students should know how to write. They, they should have learned that in, in, the, in their high schools, right? And I don't have the time to teach that. I have to focus on the discipline. And mm -hmm. then they come in the first year, second year, third year. And by the time fifth year, they'll be like, they should have learned that in the first year. So we're always passing the buck to whoever the educated the students before us and making assumptions about what students know and assuming that they should know. Like if they are at this stage in their educational career, they should already know how to write and already know how to not plagiarize. So we've not built in time into our curriculum to teach them that, which means we need to take a step back and say, make sure that while we're teaching the subject, we are teaching them all these skills and how, how to engage in writing or in any kind of assessment in a way where they can demonstrate their learning without plagiarizing or without engaging in you know academic um, un unknowing academic integrity violations so that's that the second part of your question julia which was you know constructive disciplinary procedures for those of you who haven't explored there's a there's a there's a movement and shift now to restorative approaches it comes from the legal system and it's looking at things more from a constructive proactive relationship building approach where you're one and you're out it's not it's not punitive it and so so look up less again like i do trainings on this but restorative approaches and where you say this is the impact look at the impact of your actions and so you set it up proactively and then if there is an impact you have policies and procedures that are meant for the students to learn from the experience as opposed to be written off and saying your life is over in the higher ed system so just yeah those are some thoughts. And do you think 
possibly increase compassion for students. So stuff like flexible demands or retakes without penalties, for example. Do you think that could lead to more academic honesty or do you think people would take advantage? I think you have to change the culture so it's not a gaming. Yeah. Because I think actually, you know, again, particularly with medics, they are incredibly, probably actually the same as any, any other student, incredibly mm. um, determined to achieve. And, and will, you know, spot the exam questions, spot what's come up um, and try to game any system that we put in place. And actually that's that transparency mm -hmm. um, uh, with deliverable consequences that are meaningful, that can allow the student to learn. Um, and so that we're developing them as a whole so that when they leave their, their higher education institute, they have got that, that integrity inbuilt into their, their being. Yeah, and that's an interesting point um, about the fact that most of you on our panel are um, involved in medicine and health sciences. And obviously, medical students will often go through the rest of their life doing exams. So do they need to be prepared in a different way um, compared to, for example, a history student? Um, do they need a different way of teaching about exams and about in academic integrity? So what? So what I, I, I don't necessarily think so. So it comes back to, you know, I think someone in the chat, like I, I'm not fully monitoring, but someone talked about international students, right? And yeah. so when we think about standardized exams, so things like even you know, GR, GMAT prep or GRE prep, so you have all these tuition centers that are coming up because it's training students to think a particular way, you know, approach, like get familiar with the exam and get familiar with the way the questions are asked and how to interpret it. And so I, I think it comes back to what do we, it comes back to that earlier question that all of us, I think, spoke to, Fadi spoke to this really well. Like, what is the assessment for? What are we trying to make sure students learn and demonstrate and understand? And are we, and the big point is, are we communicating that to the students, right? Helping students understand that this is what you need to learn. This is what will help you succeed in your profession in the future. So for a history student, who may be using, who may want to go on to become a historian, or may want to put that major into use in some other way, right? Helping frame it from a perspective of where do you want to take these skills? What skills do we want you to learn from the profession? And then what do we want you to, what, what do you want to get out of it, right? Having that conversation and then designing your assessments. I don't think, I don't think there's a difference. I think, yes, the intensity of, you know, the, the kind of exams that a particular profession has to take, which has certification and licensure and whatever, as opposed to another one, the, the number may be more, the intensity may be more, but I think it's, it goes back to a history student may have to take another standardized exam. So they may still, it, it's just understanding and helping them understand what they need to learn and how and why it's important to approach it and, and prepare for it in a way that's meaningful. And for these point, to for these point, that they can handle the stress and that they have the skills and study skills and time management skills and learning skills. And Claire's point, how do you reflect? Do you know how, like, you know, making things explicit and clarifying things, I think go a long way. That's just my thinking. Yeah, I look at probably, uh, I look at this in, in two ways. Um, how do you deter and how do you detect? Okay. And this is how I always teach my staff. So, so deterring, um, make it more harder to cheat. Um, always mentioned here, put policies, raise awareness. And with regards to awareness um, and human psychology, I read this, uh, I forgot who was the author, but usually we usually start with awareness and awareness and awareness and awareness in education. But uh, the author's view was it start with setting out the penalties. And this is, if you do this, this is the penalty. Watch out, this will be applied after three months, after one year and then start with the education. So it's very clear. <laughs> it's very clear that what are the penalties and then start with the education. If we keep on like uh, in some, um, in some uh, probably meetings I sit and they talk about some uh, cases where there was some misconduct or mis uh, misconduct with regards to academics. Um, there's always that discussion of they don't know, they're not aware, they don't know, until when can we give this excuse? Until when can we use this excuse? Um, we've been through so much education and you're talking someone like, I'm talking about licensure exams or classification exams. They're really high level, high stakes. So the context is very important. 
um, the level of, of stakes, high stakes, medium, low stakes is important. And when we talk about deter, I think we put as much more into deter, we'll need to put less into detect. So raising awareness, setting clear policies. I think one of the deter is announcing the penalties. If there was a penalty and really showing that this penalty was taken and keeping people anonymous here, uh, this penalty was taken, it's one of the two factors. Security does that very, very well in airports. Yeah, it's Foucault's the whole, you know, the, the eye, like the, that you will follow no matter uh, I, Foucault's work. So just go <laughs> look that up. Yeah. Uh, but, but Julia, your point also made me think about the fact that we, do we have the space in our classrooms, in our relationship with students to tell them, if you're not ready to take the exam to tomorrow, mm -hmm. like can, can reach out to me. Don't, don't do something mm -hmm. that you will regret five years later because one mistake can cost you, right? So do we open the door and do we just say that? Like, I mean, we may assume it, but even saying that to our students saying, can you come and talk to me and, and tell me and then we'll figure out a way forward, right? Is, is I feel like it's building relationships, so yeah. Absolutely, you're really providing that safe, uh, the psychological safety, and that's the most significant factor for anyone to conduct any cheating behavior or to, to think about it even, is that psychological aspect, the psychological pressure. Providing the psychological safety, I think that's one of the main preventive measures. Students are very brilliant, very smart. They know what's cheating, what's not cheating. I'm sure a, a, a six-year-old, seven-year-old would say, no, about that. this is probably cheating. So um, I think that psychological safety is very, very important. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that up. And I wish I had emojis. Oh, sorry. I would keep like saying yes, yes, yes to everything that the other panelists are saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. We like the positivity. <laughs> um, and what tools and knowledge do you think enable staff to communicate and promote academic integrity? Anyone so, want to so answer I'm, I'm happy to take it. Oh, Claire, go for it. I was just going to say, it's the consistent messaging. I think yeah. it's coming back all the way through with this consistent messaging, this culture, this inbuilt stuff. And I think if you if you look at it, it comes from the student, the faculty, and then the way that the teaching is set up. And, you know, if we've got construct, true constructive alignment between the taught course and the assessments, then the academic integrity concerns or, or teaching around it will be inbuilt into the curriculum and then our assessment constructs can back that up and you know in terms of tools they're the same as any other teaching tool we've just got to use every uh, method appropriate to get the message out there and ensure that it's a consistent transparent message mm -hmm. and I think that as long as we do that across the different platforms then all those that um, students can access it in different ways to suit their own personal learning style. So. I think it's I think it's also helpful for um, those who are um, those staff who are closely involved in uh, assessment to have um, you know to keep their their professional development going um, you know to I don't know attend what other, whatever courses could help them and I know within our department um, when it's the assessment team, they're, they're always kind of working together. So when everybody gets together to mark the, um, the, the short essay questions for whatever, it's kind of a social occasion. And everybody's kind of, you know, looking at the, at the, at the questions together and realizing, okay, what, um, what was going on here? Were, were possibly some of these students um, collaborating too much? Um, what could we have done to, uh, you know, was there anything in the question that that left it open to, to, to too much interpretation? Um, so, I mean, I think, and, and I know that our, um, our assessment lead will often do classes on like how to write really excellent um, single best answer questions, how to, um, what questions discriminate the best. I mean, I just think that these kind of CPD for, the, for all of us just just helps you know helps on that scale mm. I, I want to take that uh, one step further so you know uh, when i was in an when i was in an institution multiple institutions i would often find that faculty would tell and i, I speak as an international student so i came to the us to do pursue my second masters and and phd 
um, faculty would often send international students for who, you know, English was their second language. So if they wrote a paper, they would often send them to the writing center here in the US and they would say institutions have them. They'd say, go, go, go to the writing center, the writing center will help you. And the writing center actually needed like three months, six months, because they are not going to go and change your paper, right? They are not going to edit. They are going to tell you like, pay attention to this is the kind of grammar. This is the kind of sentence structure. These are your challenges. So they approach it from a learning, student learning growth over time. But the faculty is thinking the writing center will help the student fix their paper. So faculty have to educate themselves saying different groups of students may have different challenges in understanding what help looks like. So today, a lot of the things that have come up that are so-called help centers for students are, are faculty mm -hmm. perceive them and see them to be you know, academic integrity violation opportunities, right? Students don't know that. Students are going to them for help because they're like, oh, I have to submit my paper tomorrow. My, my writing is not the way the faculty said that it should be or whatever. So I'm seeking out this help. And so education, so one is knowing and learning and understanding cultural difference. I would say the other thing is understanding technology. I've been in so many situations where faculty did not understand that the report, whether it's a proctoring report or whether it's a plagiarism report, they were not trained. So they come in and they are like, boom, go teach this class. And mm -hmm. so they are not trained and educated as adjunct faculty or as new faculty coming in saying, how do you understand the report? How do you interpret the report? And so what they end up doing is then they engage in unknowing trauma to the students because they accuse the student of cheating when the student has not because they didn't know how to interpret the report. So teaching faculty how to use technology, how to use, understand the reports that, that come out of it, proper escalation processes so that you don't accuse a student of cheating without going through all the steps to make sure it really is right mm -hmm. and so you don't I think we've lost all me. through COVID where faculty were messaging each other saying this happened with a student now what do I do right and they don't know they don't know where to go with respect to just to follow. So having proper escalation steps um, so that no students are traumatized, that's very, very important. We need to protect our students. Um, and then I would say just building that constructive and collaborative nurturing environment in the classroom. Where, and so teaching faculty how to do that, how to engage in explicit direction versus implicit assumptions, because we have so many adult learners now we have so many folks coming back to school to earn that next next degree. So you so people don't necessarily know what they don't know. And so making sure that we make a lot of this implicit curriculum explicit and make that communication explicit, I think is really important. So those are some some of my points. Yeah, and that's really interesting about um I was thinking about accessibility issues. So for example, you mentioned digital literacy. And there's also, you know, certain people will have poor internet connection, they might be in distracting work environments. How do you tackle that when it comes to online assessment? I can take that. So in, yeah. in a lot of, um, in a lot of, again, the equity building trainings that I do with, with faculty and staff, it's just starting with get to know your students. Mm -hmm. You may have a 200 person class, you may have a five or 10, 20 person class, is it prioritizing that first class where you are explaining, making things explicit, and then asking basic questions like, it can be an anonymous poll, and then you open the door, you can set it up as an anonymous poll, 200 students take the poll saying, do you face this? Do you live in this kind of environment? Do you, what if, you know, like laying out all of these things that even you just mentioned, Julia, laying that out so that students can, res can respond, and then you open the door saying, oh, 50% of my class has internet challenges, 50% of my class lives in a joint family, or you know, has a lot of people underfoot. And so they don't know how to deal with the exam taking, right? In that, in that noisy environment in a way that they don't get accused of cheating. Um, so having, figuring out who your students are will set you up for steps that you have to take. I think that's foundational. And I think um, there's some comments in the chat about kind of workload and um, size. Obviously, Nottingham is a very, very large medical school. And Fadi's already talked about the, the vast number of students or learners that they have. I don't think size matters. <laughs> um, I think it, it is all about your process and adapting. You know, if you do come from a large school, or a large number of learners, then actually there are techniques that you can still apply to get to know your learners and to be able to uh, facilitate that open door approach to your learners. Um, so I think it's really vital that we don't use that. And I know it, it means thinking slightly 
outside the box, but there are ways of being able to um, approach the students in the ways that we've talked about, despite the size of the cohort or, or how disparate they are. You know, actually, again, our students are very disparate too. We have needed to um, give some students um, routers, internet packages that, that the university has actually paid for just because they were lived in such rural areas that they couldn't get, um, you know, internet to do their, to do their course. Um, that was in, in this strong lockdown. But, um, th you know, there's other ways that we have done it. Um, locate a nearby library, uh, locate, because we're because we're medicine, locate a hospital. The hospital might have a library that uh, that they could use. Um, so yeah, we have needed to get quite creative, and we could only do it if we know know our students. Yeah, Teresa, I've seen those practices. Probably even not knowing the students, I think giving uh, laptops uh, for students in in need, and probably giving them both options. I've seen some licensure exams giving both options of in person or online testing. So if I do not know my, my students, or I don't know the population that will take the test, like the licensure exams, you could provide both options. And I've seen some studies where they've comparatively seen that the results do not differ much between the online and in-person. So it depends on if you have access to this or that, depending on your situation. I think that's really crucial, Fadi. So one of my things about assessment and how we should evolve is actually to personalise our assessment approaches. Mm -hmm. So we've just run high stakes exams with some students sitting on a bring your own device, some sitting on site in computer rooms and some sitting at home, all using the same platform, all sitting the same exam at the same time, all securely facilitated with no academic um, integrity concerns. And I think actually personalizing that approach and enabling the students to be able to sit the assessments in a way that best helps them to maximize their performance, ease their anxiety, um, and to overcome some of the stress elements to it. And I know the students find it very stressful to sit at home or in different environments, but actually giving, if we embed that culture that actually you, it is okay to personalize your, your assessment approach um, again, is another step forward, I think. So, so that makes me also think of the, this technology piece, right? So we had to pivot. As educators, we had to pivot during COVID and post-COVID. But I don't know whether we factored in the learning that has to happen to students. We just assume that this generation of learners, like they know technology, like they are savvy. They are not. And I don't know whether in the US, uh, whether it's the same, you know, in Europe and in the UK and stuff, but we, we have different faculty using different technology, different tools, right? So you have one faculty member saying, submit it in this, and then another faculty saying, use this tool. And so we're not accounting for the time that it takes for students to learn that tool and this tool and this tool. And so having even some sense of strategy around teaching and technology and what we're asking students to learn and do, I think is, I think is, is also something that we need to factor in. So... They may know yes. how to use it, but do they really know how to use it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we give students iPads at the beginning of the year. So all five of our years of medicine, they all have an iPad. And it's great because for some students, they actually choose not to buy a laptop. And the, mm -hmm. and the iPad is 80% of a laptop and it's fine. It's what they need. For that extra 20%, they can use the PC lab in, in the university. And then that's perfect. And then we use them for... Um, for the exams, for summative exams with ExamSoft, um, and it just kind of gives a uh, gives a bit of equity. But you're right, um, uh, Divya. I have to do sessions with the students at the beginning of the year because although they know their phone, they know how to do Instagram and WeChat and whatever. But um, but do you know how to use these things to learn? No. <laughs> so we do have to teach them how to use these things to learn. <laughs> And I'd love to um, look towards the future now. Um, so obviously assessment has changed dramatically in the past few years, but how do you think assessment can continue to evolve to complement blended and digital learning? Well, I'll jump in. I love what Claire said about personalizing the learning. I, I love that. Um, and, and what I think, I would love to see more um, kinds of kind of portfolio kind of assessment, um, which includes that reflection, that, as Claire talked about. Um, yeah, I mean, 
again, in medicine, students are, you know, focused on the high stakes and the science, but they don't know how important the reflection is for them to become a human being that can then be a good doctor. And um, how do we get that across to the students? So, um, yes, I'm hoping to start to implement more of some um, yeah, some more reflection, some portfolio, like little by little as they go along, save it onto their phone, save it onto the iPad, and sort of um, include that as part of the assessment process. You can also, uh, if you allow me, please, Judy, um, one of the things is looking at assessment as a programmatic assessment, the longitudinal programmatic assessment, where there are many checkpoints, not these one end of year, end of, end of uh, semester, end of course assessments. Um, looking at the narrative assessments more than the number uh, correct or percentages. I think that will uh, enhance a lot of the learning. If we just shift more into the longitudinal programmatic assessment, structure it beforehand. It's not a pop-up that comes a pop-up quiz. No, it's structured uh, originally into when the, the curriculum is designed, um, multiple checkpoints, narrative assessments. I think that will help a lot with regards to the learning and feedback. That's where I was going, Fadi. I think um, a programmatic approach to assessment, I think it's very different between a programmatic assessment, but a programmatic approach to assessment where you have these multiple checkpoints, which are slightly lower stakes to get away from this um, necessity for the single grade endpoint end of year hurdle. Mm -hmm. Actually, what you want to do is, is uh, develop an understanding of that, that learner and actually where they're at in their level of competency. So again, you can then use that information to tailor their learning in future and actually drive the learning process for that individual based on these small checkpoint assessments to the point where they reach competency. And I think that's a real move forward, but we need the tech to be able to support that. So I, I, I love, and I, I want to build on both, both what Fadi and, and Claire said. I think, I think that scaffolding of, of learning and making sure that you're checking and making sure that then you have remediation interventions to support students where you where they are lacking in the skill or the knowledge or the attitude or behavior, whatever you want them to learn, I think is so important, which means that we need to start making sure that we actually gather data and use the data. I know exams of we have that capability, but use the data. So spend time, calendar time to say, okay, how are our students performing? Where are the gaps? Is it a curricular gap? Is it just that student or that group of students? Is it that instructor? Or is it like we need to change because we've actually, we think we've taught this, but nowhere in the curriculum have we touched this. So that's why students are underperforming, right? So looking at the data is really important. I think that's something that I want to share. And then what, what I've already shared before, which is factor in the time to teach technology, make sure that your assessments align with the outcomes that you want students to demonstrate, because often they don't. If you really do an audit, and I've done a lot of audits, they don't. They, they are assessments where we're assessing content we're not assessing to make sure that the students are able to demonstrate outcomes. And there's a big difference between assessing content and assessing whether students are able to demonstrate outcomes. So that, make sure your assessments are relevant and authentic, offer different modalities, be creative so that students can demonstrate it to the best of their ability. And then the last thing is, Claire, reflect, right? Like reimagine how you wanna think about assessment in a digital world. When, when I talk to faculty, you know, a lot of times this comes up in the future, like, is this knowledge something that they really need to know? Or is this knowledge that they can look up, they can technically look it up, and we actually need them to know something else? Do we need them to know a process for critical thinking that they know that, hey, like, no matter what situation I am in, in an emergency situation, or as a history professor, when I'm looking at a text, or as a English professor, whatever, right, or as a student, or um, um, a PR agent or, uh, you know, a food service delivery. What are the steps that they need to know for themselves that they need to have a habit of engaging in versus what can they look up? What can they Google? What can they, um, what do they not have to know immediately that we are wasting time assessing them on to say, close book, you have to know this, but really you don't, right? So rethinking and reimagining what's really needed to be assessed in a way that has academic integrity, in a way that has, where they can't collaborate and they can't ask each other and they can't you know, use resources versus what they really need to know and how are we assessing what they really need to know as a habit and as, a, as knowledge. Thank you. Whilst also, sorry, Julia, whilst also sorry. 
evolving the assessment construct so we're not just putting a knowledge-based construct into a digital platform. So all mm. of what Julia said, as well as assessing the actual process of the exam. Sorry, Julia. No, as I was just saying, we're unfortunately coming to the end of our time. So um like to open up the floor for questions. We've got a few interesting questions already. Um, and apologies in advance if we don't get a chance to answer all of these. Um, so one question is, how do our esteemed colleagues work with or bypass the partner and governing bodies, as an example, the NMC or GMC, when designing assessments, as it's often an, often the governing bodies which dictate what is seen as appropriate? Great question. We're all staring down the barrel of the MLA uh, exam, That's, <laughs> which is a new, new thing for us in the UK. I know in the United States, that's something like that has been happening for years and years. Um, we can't sidestep it. We've got to do it. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, does this mean that we're all going to be teaching to the test? I mean, that's the fear, you know. Um, so I think, um, as we've been just, just, just now discussing, talking more about reflection, talking more about what can be personalized. This is where I'm hoping we can um, uh, beef up our development of our students in these areas so that we can be absolutely sure that we are producing doctors who have all of those human qualities needed to be a great doctor, not just the score on that final MLA. You know, I'm not the right person to answer this because I'm part of the governing body and hope no one bypasses us. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll leave it to Divya and Claire. <laughs> I think you repeat the question again, sorry, Julia. Yes, sorry. It was, um, how do you work with the partnering governing bodies as an example, the NMC or GMC when designing assessments as they often dictate what seems what is seen as appropriate? It's, it, to me, it's about go, them go being, for me, the uh, PSLBs, a lot of the regulators are quality assuring the process. So, okay, so as long as you quality assure the process, then, then you hit their, their mandated, guidelines but in terms of the curricular aspects of it so the content it's a, what going back to what Divya was saying about checking that you're meeting the outcomes okay so most of the PSBA requirements are surrounding outcomes so what people need to demonstrate by the time they get there and it's about carefully reading those and tailoring your constructs um, in order to be able to to meet the needs of your PSLB. Mm -hmm. And I will, I will just, uh, you know, punt this because I'm not in the UK, but in, in the US accreditation bodies, it's peer review system. So there are opportunities where you can influence that review body, right? And so the way you, so we have to be active in our communities and our professional spaces to influence the thinking and move it in the direction where we think is more equitable, more learning oriented, increases the rigor of our profession and our institution and allows for student success. So I would, I would just offer that, yeah. yeah fantastic. Um, and I've just received quite an interesting question actually. Um, what are your views on the use of translation software? What if students go through all the right processes in preparing their submission, but they write in their own language and then translate it all at the final stage? Would you consider this a breach of academic integrity? Um, I have, <laughs> because it has happened. Um, and it was like, the first time it happened to me, I was like, what is this? And it took me a while to figure out that that's what they had done. And uh, yeah, we did have to have a discussion about that. And yet I could sympathize the, the fact that they, you know, they were challenged in English. It was, a, it was their second or third language and, you know, respect that they're doing a degree in another language, you know, so um, we just handled it um, gently. <laughs> I, I, I have an honor. go go for it, Claire. There you go. I have an alternate viewpoint. For me, the thing I, I go back to um, uh, what Claire said, right? So are we, it goes back to what are you trying to achieve? If a student is going to be practicing, you anticipate them practicing in a space where they have to know the language and that becomes really important in terms of the work that they're going to do, then, then, you, then it makes sense that then you would judge them on their English skills as well, right? But we constantly have English as a second language as an equity conversation because then are we creating barriers for students just because they don't know English as opposed to them knowing English? So it, that's a question that you need to ask and then be upfront with students about, hey, like you need to know this if you're practicing here, this is what it is. Um, I think it's more of a question. I haven't dealt with a situation like Therese 
you know, personally. So I would defer to her experience and her expertise, but it's a question to ask saying, why is this, why is this a barrier? Because the knowledge is, is the knowledge there? And is that, what, what is it that they need to be able to do a demonstration? Well, unfortunately, I think that brings us to the end of our discussion. Um, I know we could probably go on talking about this for a lot longer, <laughs> um, but I'd really love to thank all of our panelists for taking part today. And I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that there'll be an on-demand recording and a summary article published on the Times Higher Education website in due course, um, which will the link will be emailed to you. Um, so I hope you found today useful and we really hope to be able to engage with you at future Times Higher Education events. So thank you so much to my lovely panel. <laughs>